Um, so, sorry for being late. Um, we are going to uh, go on our uh, our afternoon with uh, two presentations. And first, a presentation about a religious movement I, I never heard about before. I, I asked you to do this. Yeah, <laughs> it's very interesting today. We are learning lots of things actually. So we're going to. Uh, listen to Susan Palmer from uh, McGill, Montreal, and she's going to present us a presentation and analysis about the Freedomite uh, Doco Wars. Yes. Oh, listen to you. Okay, it's not four o'clock yet. Is that no, 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 uh, I said we really? not earlier. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. fine, great. Okay, so um, this presentation is about a pacifist movement that had to occasionally resorted to violence and also uh, experienced violence at the hands of the government, two governments, um, the government in Russia and the government in Canada. And these two uh, photographs sh uh, show um, the, the first one on your right shows a Russian Orthodox priest blessing the troops. So it shows the you know state and religion how it goes together and how they endorse violence I guess, and the second one is after the Dukabors migrated to Western Canada, um, they they were reacting to the assault on their values, their their communalism, their refusal to fight, their their pacifism, and the way they um, reacted, the, the way they protested was to. Uh, strip nude and burn things down, arson. So you see the two, the contrast between the two. Um, we don't see them as being naked. Well, I, w I thought I'd be tasteful for, th you know, sake of Did you tender you sensibilities you? here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> there are many amazing naked pictures of Duke of Boys, but I figured some people here might be upset, sure, sure. so sure. I have to be. Sure. <laughs> well, what I did is reduce them so they're <laughs> tiny, so you can't really see. That's what I did. Anyway, okay. So, uh, War and Peace, the Russian Dukabors in Canada. Now, Dukabor history provides an interesting example of the tensions and complex relationship between peace and war. The Dukabors are an uncompromising Russian Christian pacifist movement. They go back to the mid 17th century. They emigrated from Russia to Canada between 1898 and 1903 to escape the wrath of the czars who are pressuring them to you know, fight. Although promised free land and military exemption in, in both Saskatchewan and British Columbia, both provinces reneged on their agreements and began pressuring the Duke of Boers to join the war effort and would punish these conscien conscientious objectors. In response to this pressure, a radical branch of the Dukabors formed called the Sons of Freedom, who held violent protest marches and perpetrated arson and bombings. The authorities responded with mass arrests, long prison sentences, harsh punishments and torture, and raids on the children of the Sons of Freedom, who were forcibly separated from parents and sent to a remote prison-like school. These children today in their 70s call themselves the children of New Denver. That was the name of the school and, and the town also. They are lobbying for an apology from the British government. They've been lobbying for years and they it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Now the research method is partly based on archival research, you know, books and articles and so on, and collecting data during a field trip to the Kootenays region of BC, that's in southern BC. Actually, uh, Bernadette was with me at the time. She, we were both staying with the 12 tribes. In July and August 2019, where I and my research assistant Shane interviewed 16 descendants of the Sons of Freedom. So these were people now in their 70s who had been children in the 1950s when they'd been taken from their homes and put in this, this residential school. Um, and we also interviewed the current leader, and we met at the Dukabor Museum in Castlegar. It was pretty amazing because uh, Shane actually organized it. As soon as we got off the plane in Castlegar, we went to the Dukabor Museum, which is right across the street from this tiny airport, 
And the Nukabers were just sitting there waiting for us in the conference room. So it was fantastic. We started interviewing them right there, and we met, met them at their homes and got their stories. Um, and there were archival materials supplied by the families, and there, there are many Dukapur family historians who are really good, amateurs, but really good ones. And also, the Dukapur Museum in Kaskalar has excellent uh, archival material. Um, yeah. We also traveled in June 2018 to Ottawa, to interview Ottawa's leading, Canada's leading Dukabor historian, Kuzma Tarasov. He's very prolific, and he's of Dukabor descent. This research was funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada for a four-year project, Children and Sectarian Religions and State Control. So my purpose was to uh, interview, I'd wanted to do this for years, for, for about a decade, I'd wanted to interview these survivors of the you know, residential schools of New Denver. Actually, it's not technically a residential, I'll explain that later. But when I tried to do it when I was working at Dawson College and I had a grant, they said, we'll only give you permission to research. This is my research ethics board, what they call an IRB in the US. They said, we'll only give you permission if you write up uh, this paper you have to give out to all your you know, human subjects, saying that this is very disturbing material. If it disturbs you to talk about this stuff, you should consult a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist. And then they said, you have to do research in the area and find some people you can send them to in case they freak out after you interview them. So I looked and I, I went on the interview. Who's, who's in southern BC? Well, you had a shamanistic drumming guy. You, you had a union dream analyst. <laughs> You had all these like new age therapists, they'll charge $400 an hour. I thought, I'm not going to tell these people. Camillarian, remember? Yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, I can't, I can't do that. I don't know anything about, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know who, I just refused. So I just didn't do it. So I had to wait until I got a different grant and was at McGill and they were more enlightened and didn't demand this ridiculous thing for me to do. Um, okay, so the tomb Dukabor means spirit wrestlers in Russian. And it emerged out of a dissenting peasant group in southern Russia in the mid-1600s. Since they rejected the written Bible, books, and literacy, their, teachers were, their teachings were orally transmitted, hence their origins are somewhat obscure. So when you study uh, Dukabor history, it's really hard to figure out what the heck is going on. You know, it's not like studying new religions today where you can look at the roots of violence and what happened, blah, 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 you know, uh, the trajectory of violence. Um, because for one thing, their leaders are really enigmatic and mysterious, and they don't keep any notes of their meetings, and they don't write or read. So, you know, you just get people's oral, this happened, I saw this, blah, blah, you know. Um, initially, the Dukabors called themselves people of God or just Christians, implying other sects or churches were not Christians. And in 1785, the tomb Dukabur was first used by an archbishop uh, in derision. It means spirit wrestlers, but he was suggesting that the heretics are fighting against the Holy Spirit. But the Dukabors embraced this term, claiming they fought with the Spirit of God who dwelt within each one of them. In 1799, the word Dukabor was used for the first time in a Russian government order Everybody who shall be convicted of belonging to the sect of Duca Bortzi shall be condemned to lifelong labor. <coughs> now, the beliefs and characteristics of the Duca Bars are as follows. They reject church liturgy, believing that God dwells in each human being, not in a church. They reject secular governments. In other words, they're anarchists. They reject war and violence, and they practice pacifism and vegetarianism. They they're really believe in ahimsa, you know, nonviolence towards animals. The Bible was cast aside, replaced with an orally transmitted psalms and hymns as part of the living the book. The living book really means your day of life in the commune and your love for your fellow people and your hard work and so on. But it also means this, this kind of living Bible, like a, a choir that sings the Bible every day. Um, these are sung at their spiritual gatherings. Their only symbols are bread, salt, and water in their, in their spiritual gatherings. 
Several Dukabor leaders are revered as divine, but Dukabors believe that God resides within each person, hence all are equal. And at one time, at some times, these leaders would get possessed by the Spirit of God and they'd act crazy, you know, like crazy. Like I had a friend who was a Dukabor, and well, you know, like not a secular Dukabor, and we were just walking along the street in Montreal at night, and he suddenly jumped up and ran, ran across the parked cars like leaping, bounding, like a kangaroo. It was the spirit? Yeah, he said it was, he said it was the Holy Spirit filled him. <laughs> anyway, um, now communalism was once a strong ethic based on toil and peaceful life, but today most Dukabors no longer live communally. Many are still vegetarians and all practice pacifism. The origin of the Dukabors, the early leaders, um, it originated out of the Raskol, or the Great Schism, which divided the Russian Orthodox Church after the Patriarch Nikon instituted a series of ritual reforms, like you should use two, not three fingers, and that kind of thing. Um, in 16, or maybe the other way around, I don't know, 16... No, it, it said that it's for the sign of the cross, otherwise yeah. they would think it's to eat. You know? No, no, it's for the, yeah, you're right, sign of the cross. 1650, army deserter Danilov Filipov became a hermit mystic preaching against the church and its liturgy. And he had many followers who went on to found other, um, you know, new religions. In 1750, the first Dukobor, quote, leader was Silvan Kolesnikov, who arrived in Ekaterinoslav. And he claimed to be just tr transmitting the doctrines of previous teachers like Filipov. He still relied on the New Testament. But after him, Ilarion Pobirokin, sorry, I should really ask, uh, I should have asked Rosita how to pronounce these names. Um, a wool de, pardon? Thank you, <laughs> that sounds better. He was a wool dealer who was proclaimed the successor, and he also denounced worship of images, ritual of the church. He rejected the written Bible because it causes dissension because people interpret the text differently. And he developed the Dukabor oral tradition of hymns and psalms. And then Pobirokin, thank you, Pobirokin, proclaimed that he was the living Christ and appointed 12 apostles and 12 death-bearing angels who would publish, punish backsliders. Now, the first uh, strategy of, of the Tsar was, well, Alexander I decided just to send them, you know, out into the kind of wilderness so they wouldn't contaminate the rest of the Russian citizens. So they started a Russian colony in Crimea, and um, this uh, Kap Kapustin, uh, one of the early leaders, um, organized something called the Orphan's Home, which turned out to be a lot more than a home for widows and orphans. It was actually a center of commercial enterprise and farming, and it was like the, the, you know, the hub of the community. It became very successful, and um, he was accepted as a divine leader, or Vojd, is that right, Vojd, of the Duke of Bors. And when he died, he passed the role to his son, Kalmakov, and Kalmakov uh, was successful for, oh, 40 years or so, more than 40 years. And then he passed on his spiritual power to his wife, Lucaria, who on his deathbed through eye contact. So the idea is that leader can sometimes pass on his, his power through eye contact just before he dies. And the wife was the one who was at his bedside, which is normal, of course, so she became the next leader. And um, under her, they, the community thrived. And, um, and she had an interesting approach to domestic violence. Um, when a man was found to have beaten his wife, he would be locked up in the chicken coop overnight. And when he came out with his hair all full of chicken feathers and pecked, everyone would laugh at him. So this is a good way of discouraging them. Um, she also had armed bodyguards because they lived in a settlement which was kind of wild, you know, with wild tribes around or whatever. Um, and she never had children, so before she died, she chose this young man, Peter Vedigan, who was a young Dukabor, 
um, from Slavyanka as her successor. She divorced him from his wife and took him to her village. And after her death, the village refused to accept him and her relatives ref refused. But the majority of the Dukabors uh, embraced him. And so he became uh, really the great leader of the Dukabors, the most famous, you know, uh, admired leader of the Duke of Bors, who, and he brought, he appeared in Canada later on. Um, okay, now, now Peter Verrigan was arrested by the authorities and sent into exile into Siberia, and there he had quite a good life. He had a nice house. He had a servant, his secretary. He also had a carriage and horses. Strangely enough, so he had quite a pleasant life in exile. And he wrote letters to Tolstoy because he read Tolstoy and liked his ideas on, on peace and war and so on. And he wrote to his followers to reaffirm their Christian ideals. And he added vegetarianism, communal living, <clears throat> and abst abstinence from vodka. And in 1893, uh, oh, sorry, in eight, yeah, he learned then about Tolstoy. And he communicated, there's a, there's a correspondence between him and Tolstoy, who very much loved the, the Duke of Bors. Through secret couriers, he in, instructed the Duke of Bors to gather and burn their weapons. So in 1895, the Duke of Bors, all over Russia, in fact, uh, publicly burned their muskets in an event known, known as the burning of arms. <coughs> and this may have been the first Pacific protest pacifist protest in modern times. Here's a picture of it. It says there were around 7,000 Dukabors who burned their firearms, um, their muskets, dramatically rejecting military service. And the protest is marked on 29th, June 29th is each year, which happens to be Peter Verrigan's birthday. Um, so Leo Tolstoy, there's an interesting book called Leo Tolstoy and the Canadian Dukabors, which looks at their relationship. And after finishing War and Peace in Anna Karenina, Tolstoy experienced a, a spiritual crisis that led him to denounce the wealth and privilege of his social class, the aristocracy, and embrace the simple rural life of the peasantry. He saw in the persecuted Dukabors um, the, their quest for an imminent God, a prime example of how it was possible to live with these newfound pacifist ideals in everyday life. He called them the people of the 25th century and wrote, the Duke of Bors faith approaches most closely the moral stature of people seeking God. Around 500 years from now, the beliefs which made it necessary for them to resettle in America, he met Canada, will prevail among the majority of Christian people. So in 1898, he decided to help finance their mass emigration to Canada away from the persecution of their Russian state and church. So he paid for their boat ride, and his followers also contributed, and also some Quakers, but mostly Tolstoy. So in 1898, um, around seven and a half thousand Dukabors sailed for Canada, and first they settled in eastern Saskatchewan. Peter Verrigan, with 500 others, joined them in 1902, and this was the largest mass migration in Canadian history. By 1908-1912, he was, oh, by the way, Peter Verrigan was called Peter the Lordly. The majority of that first col colony opted to purchase land in southern BC, where Castle Gar and Grand Forks, these two towns, became the heartland for Dukabors. Um, he, he left, they left because uh, basically the Saskatchewan government reneged on their promise to make them exempt from military service and also to give them land and to allow them to live semi communally. But they started to insist that you have to have private property under each person's name, and that was against their, their ethics. In Russia, they lived communally. In BC, they continued this practice with all the land registered under the name of Peter Verrigan. They developed successful commercial enterprises, producing fruits, vegetables, jams, jellies, and honey. Now, there are five themes in the diary that Verrigan wrote when he was in exile in Siberia, which were 
sent out through um, couriers to the Duke of Bors and brought to Canada too. So the five things were, first of all, pacifism, nonviolence, and this meant bearing arms and um, not eating meat. Land ownership, he revised them to return to the ancient Ducabor traditions of Christian communism. Truancy, he promoted the ideas of early Ducabor leader Poberokin, who rejected the Bible and books <coughs> and developed the notion of the living book. So this is why they got in trouble later and they wouldn't send their children to school and their children were taken away. Nudity, he wrote in his diary that Ducabor's must seek primitive conditions and a spiritual stature, stature lost by Adam and Eve. Arson and bombing, the Freedomites' ritual practice of setting fire to buildings, clothing, and vehicles may have originated in the 1885, sorry, 1885 burning of arms in the Caucasus, but uh, historian Ham also suggests they inherited the Russian peasants' scorched earth strategies from the Napoleonic Wars in 1812. The significance of nudity, see I have teeny little pictures that won't offend anybody, I hope. Um, Very frustrating. <laughs> Vergen advised in his 1896, well I, was, I already read that, wrote the sons of man shall never be the slaves of corruption. So the idea is clothes uh, are vanity materialism but also class consciousness. You can tell a person's class by their clothes. He wrote, I propose that people would gradually get used to physical nakedness. The Sons of Freedom regarded human skin as God's creation, more perfect than clothing, which was the imperfect work of human hands. For them, public nudity was not erotic, but rather a means of identifying with Adam and Eve and the animals before the fall and a way to protest materialism and corruption in society. So for them, nudity was kind of a magical act. And when they were arrested by m mounties or, you know, attacked, they would just shed their clothes and people would go, ah, you know, leave them alone. Well, what about being in Canada in the wintertime? Well, that's the amazing thing. They, they did this march in Saskatchewan in 2002, and or I think it's around 3,000 of them marched. And naked well first of all they didn't start off naked but eventually they started taking off their clothes and then the government came and took away the the women and children so they and then the men kept marching without clothes and it was so freezing that the ones who had clothes would surround them and sort of you know keep them warm and they all survived um, <laughs> in 2001 the last arsonist from the sons of freedom was who was an 81 year old woman named mary braun received a six-year sentence for setting fire to a community college, Bildi, causing three, 350,000 in damages. She disrobed in court. This is, was her 15th <laughs> conviction for arson. I actually interviewed the judge because he happens to be my, um, yeah, my close friend's brother-in-law. So he, he was there, he knows all about it. And what was the reaction? Well, they're just like, oh, no, please, not again. Please, Mary, put your clothes back on like, in court, you know. Um, so there's also the rejection of books, lit literacy, and public schools. In the early 1800s, the Russian Dukabors, mainly illiterate already, they renounced the written Bible following the advice of their current leader, Kolesnikov. The Bible was replaced with a living book, Daily Virtuous Life, in their communities, led by the promptings of the Holy Spirit within each person. Christ's teachings became enshrined within an oral tradition in their 200 memorized psalms and polyphonic choral works. Varigan supported Kolesnikov's views on literature in his 1896 diary. Therefore, the Dukobors in Canada continued to speak Russian inside their communities. They brought their kids up in Russian, and they refused to send their children to public school. One reason they, they told me they didn't want kids to go to public school is because the kids were taught patriotism, you know, and they were taught to sing, you know, Patri God Save the Queen, etc. And also, they were taught competitive sports like boxing, and uh, even dodgeball was considered aggressive and violent. And... Um, 
So they didn't want their kids corrupted in this way. Now, schisms started to form in the Dukabor community. Saskatchewan gave them free land, but in 1907, around 30,000 acres reverted to the crown because they insisted on, because they, the Dukabors insisted on collective ownership. This led to a three-way schism. The independents decided to co cooperate with a secular state by assenting to the signing of contracts. So they were, became secularized uh, Dukabors. The community Dukabors, who were the largest group, remained loyal to Peter Verrigan and preserve their religion, collective ownership of land, and cultural patterns. And they moved to British Columbia, about 8,000 of them, and they became farmers. Um, the Sons of Freedom um, was the third schism that formed, started in, starting in 1902 on that march I was talking about. Here's a picture of the winter trek, 3,000 people in search of Christ the Bridegroom. Um, now, they were betrayed. They, when they first came, they were allowed to register for individual homesteads, not quite to live communally, but then, uh, but then when this new Minister of the Interior named Frank Oliver came in, he, inter he interpreted the Dominion Lands Act strictly, and um, their homestead entries were cancelled. And it was really a shame because they put so much work into building orchards and farms and planting in trees, and it was really very sad. In 1908, Verrigan, as I said, that left, um, you know, moved to, um, okay. The rise of the Sons of Freedom, the, their uh, Russian name is Svobod, how do you pronounce that? Svobodniki. Svobodniki. Oh, you, you, I see Svobod, it's the middle syllable, okay. No, no. Oh my God. Okay, so let's 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 jump ahead here. Okay, so th this here we got violence. Um, Peter Lordley was killed in a railway explosion. I was never found out who the perps were. It could have been the Sons of Freedom. It could have been the government. Um, they're pacifist. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to talk about the children. Good. This is my last section. In the 1950s, the because the Sons of Freedom refused to send their children to public school, um, Bennett, who was this hardline premier, ordered that the, the RCMP, the Mounties, come in and seize the children who were um, forcibly placed in a school in New Denver, which was 99 kilometers north of Krestova, which was the Dukabor village. Um, and the Attorney General, uh, promoted ongoing raids on the children, and the children were all hiding. Many of them were hiding in the mountains, in the woods, in the winter, you know, during the day. There were camps where kids were hiding in the winter to escape from the mountains. And now this institution lasted for about six years, from 53 to 59. And by 59, the parents couldn't stand it anymore, so they signed an agreement to send their kids to private, to public school, and then, they got their kids back. Um, and the numbers may have been as high as 200 children. And they, they, in the school they built this big wire fence between the parents and the children so the parents could only touch their children through the fence. And here they're holding one of their traditional um, spiritual uh, things. Um, a few boys said they were sexually abused by one of the mate twins who was a six high, six-foot-tall, powerful woman who used to drag them into closets and sexually abuse them. So Very the, unusual. The woman would abuse the boy. Yeah, there wasn't any uh, of the other type. type. And they said that education was very pure. Now, the point is to, t to make them literate and to educate them. And they said that their teacher just read Hardy Boys and asked them to give her candies and giggled all the time. So they learned nothing <coughs> in her class. Um, and they were very, and they were forbidden to speak Russian, and they missed their parents. It's very cruel. And there's a book uh, which I just ordered actually on the description of this, this one girl's life in New Denver. Um, now, after the problem was solved, of the, the, the after the children went home in '59, and they went to the private schools, this did not really tame the Sons of Freedom because in the 1960s. 
there were still uh, many bombings and burnings. People died in violent demonstrations. And um, Sons of Freedom were sent to prison. And um, Sima Holt, who's their big enemy, wrote in the Vancouver Sun that <coughs> over 40 years, 1,112 depredations by the Sons of Freedom have cost Canada's taxpayers a minimum of 20,872. Oh no, 20,800. So, sorry, 20 million. Well, anyway, you can see. In destruction, police, and court costs. And in 2001, the last. Oh, I mentioned that already. Okay. Now, what was, what's the meaning of all this? One way of seeing it is a, it's a strategy of simul assimilation. And the words that come out of the mouths of the politicians certainly support this idea. Um, Anderson says uh, the Dukabers are resistant to racial assimilation, saying their kids need public education. And a paramount factor in racial fusion is the education of children in these non-English races. Sullivan's Royal Commission says the only real permanent solution of the Dukabor problem lies in education. Um, psychologist says the majority of Dukabors are partially sick and unhappy, and that it's their own fault. And Premier Bennett says, finally, he changed his rhetoric and says the kids have a right to an education. Now, there's popular prejudice. This delightful Canadian comic writer, Stephen Leacock, uh, uh, says, of these migrants, we are to make a mixed race, which is to be the political wisdom of the British, the chivalry of the French, the gall of the Galician, the hungriness of the Hungarian, and the dirtiness of the Dukabor. So people would call them the dirty dukes. Um, the, they are defying the laws of Canada, uh, the perennial nuisance, the naked Nukabor, and um, anyway, that sort of thing. Racist talk, in fact. Yes, Susan, No. Yeah, yeah. You've been here over 35 years. <laughs> okay, I was just going to talk Maybe about. Maybe you, you, you can project some slides while we okay. we're taking the questions, so people also can uh, have oh, to the good idea. Of your okay. Presentation, yeah. Okay. So. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for this presentation. I, I knew nothing about the Duke Awards before, and now I nearly feel I'm a specialist of the issue. It was very <laughs> pedagogical, so thank you very much. Sorry for pressing you, but maybe we can have a look to the next slides, and uh, we will get some more information. Yeah, yeah. uh, so, are there, I see uh, one hand raising, a question yeah, to Suzanne. The mic is arriving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The microphone is arriving. It's behind you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had a question and also maybe an idea for you. Um, the question would be, you mentioned that there are symbols uh, for ceremonies, at least early on, where bread, salt, and water. Are you familiar with what they represent, the bread, salt, and the water? It comes from the gospel. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You are the salt of the earth. Yeah. Salt and of the water earth. Water and bread. So it's a Genesis bread, reference? Yeah. No, it yeah. would be the gospel. Oh, okay. I don't know which Actually, one. Actually, somebody might say which one, in which one you are. You are the salt of the earth, but these are very Christian elements, yeah. Yeah. I, actually, I should have asked them about that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, d but did you mention... I guess, sorry, it's, yeah. I guess, water instead of wine that symbolizes or represents the blood of Christ. I yeah. Guess change it to water. Because they don't drink yeah, alcohol. Yeah, but that's, that's typically the... Ah, uh, okay, okay. That would actually make sense. Um, I was wondering, because in the Passover ceremony, for instance, uh, water and salt are mixed together to be tears. Um, but, okay, that's a tangent. You, you mentioned your IRB uh, asked you to find therapy for uh, your human subjects, well, they if they needed it. They just said they're old, they're over 70, <laughs> so they're yeah. vulnerable subjects. I, if that happens to you again, subjects. one option to consider would be a board-certified chaplain. They're um, trained in talk therapy, actually, and that should probably go over with the board, especially if they're interfaith, and they'll be a lot cheaper than, like, what a, kind of chaplain? A board-certified. Oh, okay. Right. Well, I would just be so embarrassed if I had to hand out these. <laughs> I just couldn't face the embarrassment myself. Very good. Uh, thank you. There is a question back of the room. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, actually, I have two questions. I don't know if you will be able to answer. And one remark, I think their biggest sin in Russia was to abandon vodka. You don't <laughs> do that in Russia, you know. Uh, nevertheless, do you know if there are still Dukobov in Russia? Or they all Yes, left? there are. There are, I think they ran a 4,000 last time I heard. And in fact, Tarasov, that man in Ottawa we interviewed, goes back to see them every, every summer. Okay, yeah. interesting. Okay, and my second question is, how do they see themselves? You spoke about the schism and the old believers. How do they see themselves in regards to the old believers? Like, Oh, well, I think they have some... S you mean the old believers of Russia? Yeah. Well, they have some strong similarities in, 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 you know, why they left the church and what they believe in. I don't really know. I didn't talk to them about it, but... Um, they have been referred to sometimes in Tarasov's writings. So, are there sorry, are, are there, yeah, I, I, I see there's no more questions. Really, thank you very much, Susan. Thank you.